Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ from Tony Brew Ministries, presenting the following sermon from Ephesians chapter 5, entitled, Why Should I Love the Church? The church is the most fantastic thing that has ever been because you can say the church and people think different things. They might think of the Baptist church, the Methodist Church, the Pentecostal Church, the Church of God, the General Church of God, the Presbyterian Church, all kind of names you can put to the church. You might think of an organization as a church. You might think of the church like the IPHC, International Pentecostal Holiness Church. That's the general conference of the International Pentecostal Holiness Church and then you have conferences under that that have churches and within those local conferences you have churches and sometimes within churches that make up a district within a conference and then it comes down to the local church and then Jesus said if there are two or three that are gathered in my name I am in the midst of them so that makes a church it may not have a name to it but if we're gathered in his name we're part of the church and even if there are not two or three there I'm there with the Lord and that's a majority and that makes a church I am part of the church you are part of the church Now the question comes why should I love the church Ephesians talks a lot about the church. Verses 22 and 23 of chapter 1. Have put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. When we're talking about Jesus and we serve the Lord, we're serving one who has all things under his feet. The scripture says that we do not see all things yet under his feet. But just because we do not see them under his feet, that doesn't mean that they're not under his feet. The Bible says God has put all things under his feet when he raised him up from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name which is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. When he set him all far above all principality and power, and it doesn't mean just a smidgen above it, it means way up there above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name. The name of Jesus. God has put all things under his feet. That means the church is under his feet. When it's talking about under his feet, that means under his authority, under his rule. The church is under his authority. The church does not set the authority. The church takes authority from her Lord, Jesus Christ. He is the head of the church. He gave him, that is God the Father, gave him to be the head over all things to the church. He's the head over all things. If he is the head of all principality and power and might and dominion, that means that whether they like it or not, it's not the political party that rules the government. They may be controlling it right now, but the one who is really in charge is Jesus Christ. He is the head over all things. And if he's the head over all things, he certainly should be the head over all things to the church. If we realize that Christ is our head, that would take away from this preacher ego and this personality conflict that comes so many times. We want to follow this one or that one. Or we say, I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. I am of Cephas. And someone says, well, I'm of Jesus Christ. We're all of Christ. The preacher ego can build an empire, but Jesus Christ can build a church. He said, I will build my church on this rock and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
We love the church because Jesus is the head of the church. God gave him to be the head over all things to the church. He is our head. He is the head of the pastoral department. He's the head of the secretarial department. He's the head of the music. He's the head of everything. Jesus is the head of the church. And everything in the church should go up to the head and answer to him. If it cannot point to Christ, it shouldn't be in the church because it will not bring glory to God. The church is subject to Christ and it is his body. The church is the body of Christ. Jesus came to the world and he had a body just like we do. And when he was crucified and went back to the Father, being raised from the dead, he is now the Father's right hand in that human glorified body. But his body fills throughout the earth. All throughout the earth. You have redeemed saints of God. Red and yellow, black and white. They're all precious in his sight. Jew and Gentile alike. We're all precious to him. And we're all part of that church. The fullness of him who fills all in all. You should love the church because you're part of it. It's bad to hate the church if you're part in it and you're hating it. You're hating yourself. We're part of the church. We're all part of his body. We should love the church because we're part of it. We're in the church. We're in this boat together. If you make too much commotion and topside the boat, we'll all fall out. But we're not going to drown because God is with us. And he's promised to be with us. Chapter 5, verse 23, the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Just like the husband is the head of the wife. And anytime you read these scriptures from Ephesians chapter 5, you always get this thing, oh no, there goes that preacher again talking about the husband and the wife. And God help us for being so immature that we would make fun of someone who is trying to worship God and trying to help the body of Christ, trying to help marriages stay out of trouble and trying to help people stay out of hell. And the thing is, yes, the husband is the head of the wife, but that's not the most important point. The most important point is Jesus is the head of the church. If we realize that he is the head of the church, that will take care of the church. That will take care of the preacher department. That will take care of the husband and wife department. That will take care of the educational department. That will take care of the evangelistic department. They will take care of everything when we realize that Christ is the head of the church. We all need a Savior. And Jesus Christ is the Savior of the body. He is the Savior of the church. He is our Savior. That's why you can't make fun of Him and expect me to like it and get by with it. You're talking about my Savior. You get on TV and make fun of somebody's religion, say they was in a tongue-talking meeting. So what? diddle da Praise God. I hope they were. I hope the Holy Ghost gets you by the head, hair of the head and shakes you if you've got any hair left on your head. It would do people in America good to be talking in tongues before the sun went down. They'd be in a whole lot better shape than what they are on ABC, NBS, NBC, and Fox, and everything else. Christ is the head of the church. He's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. The church is to be subject unto Christ. There would be no division in the church if we would really be subject to Christ like we ought to be. Amen. Because the scripture says, except two agree, how can they walk together except they agree? And if Jesus Christ is the head of all of us, we come under his head and under his lordship, we can agree, even when we disagree on some middly, middly thing, it doesn't matter, because Christ is our head. If we don't come under the headship and lordship of Christ, and if we as a church, a local church, an individual person in the church, a corporate church, a corporate body, if we do not be subject to Christ, how can we carry out the Great Commission and reach the world for Christ when we're not subject to Christ? We have bickering and gobbling and scabbling and all these words I'm making up here back and forth between each other. Picking. You pick a chicken long enough, you'll pick him to death. And that's the way it is. But we, Paul said, if you eat and devour one another, take heed lest you be consumed one of another. You will not make any progress that way. 
But the church is alive and well. I want you to know that the true church of Jesus Christ is a glorious church. It is alive and well, and it is subject to Christ. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. That's a tall glass of milk to fill up, by the way. If you love your wife like Christ loved the church, I don't know what in the world will happen. There'd probably be some people having to go to Walmart. If you're of a certain age, you'd probably have to go to Walmart and go in the baby department and shop again. <laughs> if you love your wife like Christ loved the church, why should I love the church? Because Christ loved the church. If I'm going to be like Jesus, i got to love the church. Why? Because He did. It says it right here, Christ also loved the church. Why should I love the church? Because Jesus loves the church. And He gave Himself for it. He gave it. He laid out His guts, if you will. He laid it all out on Calvary's hill. He laid it all. He left it on the field, brothers and sisters. He gave it all up for us. He gave Himself for the church. Yes, He gave Himself for us individually, but He gave Himself for the church. He loves the church. He gave Himself so that we could have a church, so that we could be in a church, so that we could be involved in a church. And when we're a member of a church, that's good. But we're members of the church, the church of Jesus Christ. That's the most important thing. When you're a member of a church, when you're part of a church, you're part of something that Jesus Christ gave His life so that He could have a church. He gave His life so that He could have a bride, the bride of Christ, that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word. He wants a sanctified church, a church that is set apart, ecclesia, a church that is called out and set apart sanctify it and cleanse it. God don't want no dirty church. Not just talking about the dirt like you would sanitize. That's not the most important thing, even though there needs to be care taken to that. But the most important thing is the inward cleansing. And if you cleanse inwardly, you'll be cleansed outwardly to cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word. It's like wash. Wash, wash me in the Word. The Word, preaching of the Word. As we have been in this time that we could not come together, that we could not get together, that everything was closed down and everything was having problems. Don't judge the church by that. You can't judge the church by that because everybody is having problems. Everybody is having shortcomings. Everybody is having things that they have not been able to do. And what we need right now is not another program, not another ministry, not another opportunity. What we need right now is to be washed in water by the Word. We need God's people to come together and worship. God's people to come together and pray. God's people to come together and hear the preaching of the Word, the teaching of the Word. And we need to be preached and taught to until the Word gets a hold of us and we get a hold of the Word till it washes us and washes our body and washes our soul and washes our heart and cleanses us. We need the washing of water by the Word that He might present it to Himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish. God wants a glorious church and the church of Jesus Christ is alive and well. You cannot judge it by a virus. You cannot judge it by a pandemic. You cannot judge it by the number of people that we have and don't have because the church of Jesus Christ is not bound to a building. The church of Jesus Christ is not bound to a certain country. The church of Jesus Christ is all over this globe. Brothers and sisters from all nation, tribe, and tongue, every kindred, those who are born again and washed in the blood of the Lamb are part of the body of Christ, a part of the church. And the church of Jesus Christ, the true church of Christ, regardless of name and denomination, the church of Jesus Christ is alive and well.
And he wants to present it to himself. A glorious church. The hymn says, "'Tis a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Tis a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, washed in the blood of the Lamb." Sometimes your wife says you got a spot on your shirt and take something and get that spot off. Sometimes it's a wrinkle. You have to take the iron and kind of iron it out. You do use an iron now, you know. Take and iron it out. And sometimes it's a spot, a wrinkle, and then there's a blemish. You can't get the blemish out. You have to buy another shirt. You have to do something. But Jesus is not going to buy another shirt. He's not going to throw the church away. He's going to work on the church. He's going to wash the church in the water of the Word, sanctify it and wash it, that He might present it to Himself. A glorious church. He wants to present the church to Himself. A glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And He will even, when we get to heaven, any blemishes will be gone. He'll take those blemishes away. And we won't have to worry about those blemishes anymore. We will be perfect in His sight. Verse 29, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh. You've never seen anybody so crazy that they would hate their own flesh. But nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. The Lord takes care of the church. That's why He's the great shepherd. That's why He's the good shepherd. That's why He's the big pastor. I like it when the big preacher shows up. And we say that we like it when the big preacher shows up. Actually, the big preacher's always here. All we got to do is just let him have his way. Amen. The Lord takes care of the church. He nourishes the church. He cherishes the church. He woos the church to himself. He hugs the church to his bosom like a man does a precious lamb or like we do our dogs and cats nowadays. God help us all. But And sometimes we used to do that to our sons and daughters and still do it to our grandchildren sometimes when they let us. And there was a time when we could hug each other. I don't know why it's such a sin against God anymore, but it's we just can't hug each other like we used to. But that's a bad thing. But Jesus still hugs the church. He still cherishes the church. And any time you get lonely and any time you need a hug, all you got to do is just come aside to Him and start talking to Him and He will be right there with you. He will hug you. He will give you a kiss. He will bless you. If you need a blessing, He will bless you. The Lord takes care of the church and He gave Himself for it so He could do that. We are members of His body, of His flesh, and of His bones. When we identify with the church, it's good to be a member of a local church. But the most important thing is to be a member of the church of Jesus Christ. You can join every church in town. You can be baptized in every pool and creek and pond in Vance County and Granville County and Franklin County. So every bullfrog knows you by your first and last name. But if you don't know Jesus Christ, you're going to die in your sins and go to hell. Doesn't matter how many churches you join on this side, the main thing is to be a part of that church. And then if you're a member of the true church of Jesus Christ, you can certainly join a local church. But we're members of His body, of His flesh, of His bones. We identify with Him. You cannot love the church. You cannot not love the church because you are going against yourself. When you go against the church, you're going against yourself. When you go against the church, you're going against Jesus Christ. He gave Himself for the church. He said, He who gathers not with me scatters abroad. He who is not for me is against me. You cannot say, well, I love God, I'm for Jesus, and yet you're against the church. Hypocrite. It don't work that way. If you love God, you love Jesus. If you love Jesus, you love His church. If you love the church, you love Christ who is the head of the church. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife. And they too shall be one flesh. That comes from the book of Genesis all the way back in Genesis chapter 2. And now it's quoted again a time and, and again in the New Testament. And here he quotes it in Ephesians chapter 5. For this cause will a man leave father and mother, cleave to his wife, they too will be one flesh. This is marriage. That's what marriage is about. Marriage between a man and a woman, by the way. There ain't no other thing that can even be classified, remotely even be called marriage. 
You can't marry another man if you're a man. You can't marry another woman if you're a woman. It's an abomination in the sight of God to even think of such. But it's not me who said it. God is the one who said it. God will take responsibility for saying it. And he ain't got to be politically correct either. God said what he meant and he meant what he said. He didn't stutter and mutter and shudder. He said it like it was and was it like it is. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The church is the eternal bride of Christ. We belong to Him. People said that marriage was made in heaven. And I said, no, no marriage is made in heaven but one. And that's the marriage between the Lord Jesus Christ and His bride, the church. When we get to heaven, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching to Zion, the beautiful city of God. We're all headed to that glorious place. Why should I love the church? Because there's nothing like the church of Jesus Christ. Some people say it is a, and they see it as a place of laborious things in place where you have to go work and you have to do this and you have to do that you have to wear a suit and you have to be quiet and you have to do this and you can't not do that but it's a glorious place there's no other place like the church the church has provided comfort the church has provided prayer for the sick the church has provided a soul saving station for the lost the church has provided a place of comfort and security for those who are cast out those who are downhearted those who are broken hearted those who are derelicts those who are outcasts the church has been a place where you could come and pray the church has been a place where you could come and hear God's word. The church has been a place where you can bring your kids, the psalmist said, a place where the sparrow can lay her young and they can be safe there in the church. You can bring your kids to the church. You don't have to worry about them getting strung out on drugs. You don't have to worry about them dying and go to hell. You keep them in church and raise them in church and be in church. It's a good thing to do to be part of the church of Jesus Christ. We are the bride and he is the groom. It's part of the church of Jesus Christ, that eternal bride of Christ. And he prayed, Jesus Christ prayed that we would be one. He prayed that the church would be one. And that's what he wants us to be. He wants us to be one together in Jesus Christ. He prayed that we would be one. And when we go against that, we're going against the prayers of Jesus. Why should I love the church? Because it's the dearest thing to the heart of Father God. It's the dearest thing to the heart of Jesus Christ. It's the dearest thing to the heart of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwells every heart and life of every believer. And He is the closest thing in the church right now. Salvation is God's gift to the world. That's the greatest gift God ever gave to the world is salvation, Jesus Christ. But the greatest gift that God gave to the church is the Holy Ghost. God gave the Holy Ghost to the church. And He is in the church. He is the head of the church to Jesus Christ, of course. Spirit of Christ. Christ is on the throne with God the Father, but the Holy Spirit is operating in the church today. When we give ourselves to the Spirit of God, we are allowing God to move in us and have His way. Why should I love the church? Because that's what Jesus is coming back for, the church. He's not coming back for the sinner world. He's coming back to receive the church and to Himself. I'll go away and prepare a place for you. If I go, I will come again. I'll get you, receive you to Myself. Where I am, there you may be also. That's the church. That's the rapture. The church will go out in the rapture. Not the world, but the church will go out in the rapture. And that's who He's coming for, the church. Father in heaven, thank you for an exciting word. We can love the church because Jesus gave himself for it. He loved it, and he gave it all so that he could have a bride, so that he could have a church. And I thank you that we're part of the church of Jesus Christ. And there's room for more to come in and join, to be sons and daughters of the Most High God. May this happen to many today in Jesus' name. Amen. It's always a joy to have you listening to the old-time preaching from God's anointed Word. This sermon has been from Ephesians chapter 5, entitled, Why Should I Love the Church? Make sure that Jesus Christ is your Savior, and you know Him as your Lord today. You will be a part of that glorious church, and meet Him in the air to be with Him forever. 
This has been a production of Tony Brew Ministries.